Um, so today we're going to talk about Power Automate. This is very much a one-on-one -on -one session um, and we're going to look at some patterns and help you accelerate your development within Power Automate. Uh, first of all, thank you to all our sponsors. I'm not going to read all these out because I've only got 20 minutes so I'm already quite tight on time. Um, so I'll just let these slides up for a couple of seconds. And then on to a bit about me. So my name is Dave Buddle. I have been working with Microsoft Dynamics and with our platform for the last kind of 17 years, since version 3. Um, I recently left full-time employment and started a our platform consultancy because there was space in the market to do so. So, companies called Infiltrate Consulting, you can find me on various social channels, I'm very easy to find, so just stick my name in. If you find a penist, it's not me, but there is actually a penist called Dave Buddle as well. Um, so yeah, different person, but I'm on the listings there somewhere. So I do quite a lot of work with companies setting up and helping them with their platform. So I work with both partners and also end clients. So I've done work with the Scottish Government, I do quite a lot of work with Carry, Cobson and Proximo 3, um, the Guild Writing Association, Barrett Homes. So all these people are adopting the Power Platform and Power Automate as part of that. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to do a quick introduction to Power Automate, but I'm assuming the fact that everyone's here, you already know what Power Automate is. So I will be quick on that. Um, and then we'll have a look at some of the patterns that you can use within Power Automate to help with your development cycles. And then if we've got any time, some questions. So quick introduction to Power Automate. So who knows what Power Automate, who doesn't know what Power Automate is? Good start. <laughs> so I will skip these slides um, just around it's an automation tool to help make things happen more quickly and with some level of smartness behind it. Connector wise, the last time I checked, a few weeks ago, there was over 550 connectors now. Um, when I first presented this, there was only about 200 of them. Um, so it's rapidly grown over the last two years in terms of all the different services you can now connect to. Who's never used Power Automate? Okay, one chip. And what's some of the use cases that people have used it for? Teams creation. Okay. Um, posting message sensor uh, information into a SharePoint list or Excellent. updating the sensor planner by putting labels on. Business yes. continuity. Any other? Approvals. Hmm? Approvals. All sorts of approvals. Yeah. <laughs> Approvals for everything. Yeah. Uh, go through SharePoint sites to ask the owners if they're still needed. Excellent. Yeah, some really good use cases. Um, and how did you find working with the tool and getting it to do exactly what you wanted? Bit of a learning experience, isn't it? <laughs> For me, friendly. Yeah, there's a lot of terminology and things that you can do, and there's a lot of features that are included within those that not everybody really understands, and that's what we're going to talk about today in terms of some of the patterns that are available to use. So my advice to anyone that's using flows, always, where possible, start with a template. The chances are someone has already built what you're wanting to do. And the bonus and the kind of benefit of doing that is there's thousands and thousands of templates. They've all been fully tested, both by the person that developed it and Microsoft, before they're released into the template library. So the chances of getting one that doesn't work is fairly slim. So it removes a lot of that effort of having to come up with what connectors do I need to use, what are the transformations I need to do, someone's probably built it for you. Particularly if you're working with out-the-box connectors. If you're building a custom connector, you're out of luck. You're doing it from scratch. Um, but if, certainly if you're using out-of-the-box stuff, definitely start with a template. Because what you can do is you can take your template and then modify it. So you don't have to stay exactly with what the template does 
but it's always a really good starting point. Does anyone use templates when they start off the floor? No, a few people. Most of the time I get, no, we start from scratch and it's really difficult. Dynamic data, um, again, this is really good. Anywhere you can use dynamic data, use it. I've seen so many flows fail because some hard coded values in, and it's always the first thing to go wrong. Because all it takes is someone else in a different team to change something, and all your flows stop working. So, ready? So, yeah, always use dynamic content where you can. Um, because it will continue to update and make sure that you've always got the latest version of the variable or the latest ID and it's not a hard-coded value in there. And it's really easy to use, the dynamic content is always there, um, so utilise that functionality. Conditions and switches. Can anyone tell the difference between a condition and a switch? Condition is yes or no, switch is case statement. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So <coughs> this is a fairly uncommon use, I would say, of switches. People don't tend to go to switches straight away, um, particularly people who have been working with Power Automate for a while, because it used to be conditions were your only option, and you used to have to have condition on condition on condition on condition, and it, become, it became unmanageable after you got to about your fifth condition because you had really no idea what flow you were following through and then you had your default action at the end that didn't do anything because it was just a blank no. Um, so definitely look at what the use case is for your, your flow. If it is as simple as a, is a yes, no, so does it equal this value, yes or no, use a condition. Um, if not, and it's multiple uses, so you've got, it might be A, it might be B, it might be C, use a switch. I would also advise if it's a yes, no just now, but there's the possibility that someone's going to add a value, to use a switch to begin with, just with two options. Because trying to change it from a condition to a switch is not a fun experience. You're rebuilding your flow again. Um, so yeah, so again, just think through what is the use case of what we're trying to achieve in terms of our branching, um, and use, personally, I do everything with switches now. I don't even bother with conditions because you can do what a condition does with a switch and it just leaves it open for future improvement. How many people use variables? Excellent. What are some of the use cases you've used variables for? Uh, store static data um, that can be used later on within the, in the flow. Yep. Excellent. Uh, yeah, again, where you can set variables, always do it. Because again, what I've seen happen is people hard code it all the way through, and again, if somebody changes the parent variable, you're having to change multiple lines within your flow. Um, so variables can be very useful. It's also quite useful if you're wanting to use um, expressions. So you can set your initialize your variable, and then convert a string to a number, or a number to a string, and you can do that inside the variable without having to use a compose. Um, so there's, there's ways of keeping that within your variable rather than doing a compose and then a variable and then initialize your variable, just do it all in the variable. Um, so yeah, very useful and I use these, use these a lot. Um, and you can also use dynamic content within your variable. I've used them for default values. So yeah. I'm going to post it in dynamic, set the default, and I don't find the data, that's what's going in the set. Yeah. Particularly if you're working with required fields and yeah, exactly. you don't have a Mr. or Mrs. in your data set, just populate it with something yeah. out of the default. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I quite often use the email templates as well, where you don't have maybe a first name or a last name. Yeah. You do dear sir slash madam and you use that as a variable within your template. Um, and again, by doing it as a variable, you just change it once somewhere and it filters into all of your, your templates. Yeah. Looping. Who likes loops? <laughs> when they work. <laughs> yes. So, who knows the difference between apply it for each and I do until? Apply for each is every item on the list and do until, until the conditions met on the list. Yeah, so apply for each is when it'll apply to all actions, but do until is do until 
a certain thing is meant. Yep, exactly. When are you old enough to work? Do you do contracting? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, no, yeah. Put to the right so again, <laughs> apply to each. It does. It just keeps looking through every item in your array. So if you've done a search at the beginning and you found a thousand items, it will look through that. Um, there is some kind of improvements that you can do to apply for each. Um, so turn on um, threading so that it does multiples at the same time rather than one at a time. So what you can do when you apply to each is under the female ellipsis on the right hand side, you can go to settings and you can turn it on so that it does jobs in parallel rather than doing it one at a time. Particularly if you're working with really large data sets, um, you don't want to be sitting for two and a half hours waiting for your flow to finish when you could run ten at a time and reduce that down. Um, yeah, and do it all in, until that condition is met. So, has it done it 100 times? Has it run it 10 records? Has it done it to the pounds the last record? Um, so, yeah, some really good use cases of both of them. Any questions around looping or doing fields? Can you do threading and both? You can. Okay. Doing till you can, caveat, it doesn't always work properly. Because one could still be running when it hits your condition, you might. Yeah. So you, you just need to be careful with it. Um, you probably shouldn't be doing a do and tell on huge data sets. You should be filtering the data down first of all. Error handling. Who does any sort of error handling in the flows? I'm trying to say. I know you try it. <laughs> You're the only person I would expect to put up a hand there. <laughs> yeah, so. You need to put in some sort of error handling. At the most basic level, you need to have an error condition. So if it fails, send an email to someone just to let them know. Um, because people aren't always going to go in and check the full runs. And it's only going to be six weeks down the line when you realize all your data is missing that one value that somebody goes, well, there's something wrong here. Um, so definitely look at if a flow fails ping out a message to someone, whether that be on Teams, whether it be to Slack, it doesn't matter, just inform someone so that they can go and look at it. Um, there is some more error handling that you can do, so you can write in error handling into every single step, so you can put out what step it failed at. And you don't have to get to that level unless you're talking about an enterprise level application, in which case I probably wouldn't use Power Automate, I would move to Logic Apps. Um, and then you can put out your errors into the likes of application insights. Who names all of their steps? Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, so this is, it's good practice to do, because if you've got a flow that's got, I don't know, 50 steps and you've not named it, you've got no idea of what's doing what we are. And you have to go into every step, look at what it's doing, so get clever with your naming conventions. Yeah. You should learn that very quickly. Yes. <laughs> Not just the naming of the steps, but the naming of the flow as well. Um, particularly if you're starting from templates, it will always just do a, this connector connects to this, but with no real detail of what it's doing. So again, make use of the naming. Um, you've got 250 characters that you can put in there. So make sure that you've got something clever that you can look quickly through it and know what's the flow of the step is. Because guaranteed nobody's going to sit and document it for you. And you've probably not documented it yourself. <laughs> the next person that picks it up is going to have to go and look at it. So make it easy for them. Um, yeah, so, so clear names and again, the, the actual flow itself. Because if you are starting to do error handling and you send an email to someone, they need to know what flow's actually failed. Because if it just says, flow that connects to outward to SharePoint, you could have a thousand of them. And what will happen if you have SharePoint 1, SharePoint 2, SharePoint 3, <laughs> so what flow is it? Um, and then again, if the action within it, make sure it's all really well named. When do people save and test their flows? Right the end? Yeah. Good. Best practice is <laughs> After you add every step, if you can save and test it, do it. 
because you don't want to get to the very end to realise that your first condition is wrong and it's done something funny. Um, it saves you a lot of time. So I'm, I'm building these things. Best practice for me is anytime I can save and test something, even if it's only generating a variable, I will still test it because you can look at what is generated in the full run history. So it's all worthwhile doing. I just complete that cycle. So review the result, modify it, test it. Review it, modify it, test it. And you'll get to the end much quicker with a much better quality product. It takes you a wee bit longer to build, but it's worth it in the long run. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Um, a few minutes of questions. Um, uh, there. You mentioned the second goal about logic apps. So yes. when would you use Power Automate in that flow rather than logic apps? So if I needed more control over the processing power behind, or whether I needed it to put out stuff to application insights, so where I need more granular logging and insights into what's actually happening, um, or if I needed to run complex custom code. Do you write all your flows as like a, a centralized service account or something like that then? Yeah, so where possible, um, always assign your flows to a service account. Because as soon as that person leaves, well, that's what's it all we've got a client that we're yeah. picking up for someone that's left. Admittedly, yes. he created a couple of Canvas Power Apps at the same time. And yeah. Yeah. Canvas apps, modern yeah. driven apps, yeah. always assign them yeah. to a, a service account. Because um, best practice should be you should be doing this in a development environment and a solution, yes. yeah. and you should be using your service account to deploy yeah. into your upstream environments. So, yeah, that, that would be definitely hopefully using the ELM as well. but but it's mine, you'll still use the service again. Is there any limit of steps on Power Automate? Not that I've found. I think there is. I think that I think there will get to a point where it just will stop running. But it's also going to depend on how much each step is doing, because it will time out after that. I think it's like four hours, five hours, or something like that. I don't think that number. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, it just depends out. as well. Because if you're waiting for an action, yeah. it'll time out after, after 30 days. days. Yeah, so exactly. Wait, waiting for an approval or something yeah. like that. And then you've got to try and figure out how to then rehydrate it and get it back running. Yeah. And, which is and the chances are if you've hit the number of steps limit, <coughs> you've probably hit the API limits on Dataverse or Dynamics before it ends anyway. Just going back to the previous question on using a service account, isn't that contrary to what kind of Power Automate is there for. It's supposed to be low code, power to the end users. They're going to be creating yes. these things and it might end up being a little homegrown thing for them and then it gets used and kind of grown and adapted over yeah. time. They're never going to have access to those service accounts. That's a real contrary, isn't it? To an extent. So when I'm working with clients on their power platform strategy in general, the advice is give people access to be able to build Canvas apps, to be able to build Power Automate flows in the default environment. If it gets to a point where they are sharing it with more than a couple of people, you should really consider helping them move that into an actual managed environment um, because it shouldn't be down to that single person to maintain that application because as soon as they leave, it goes with them. Um, so, so there is a, a tipping point of if you've shared it just with your team and it's and it's genuinely a flow of the application that nobody's going to miss if it leaves, leave it in the default environment, leave it in Power Automate as it is. But if it's something that becomes business critical at some point, you need to move it into an environment that's maintained by a centralised account because it shouldn't then leave with that person. And I've seen it happen with some fairly hefty applications. Um, or it gets to the point where a few people worked on it it got adopted by the whole business and then there's one person left that's managing it and they don't want that risk of having that single failure point if anything goes wrong because it's only that one person that knows what it does and how to fix it. Yes? Can you, I don't know about this, but um, can you actually, as an administrator or as a tenant owner, run a report to actually find out what's out there in the, in the wild as such? So yes, so you can install the uh, Microsoft Central Excellence Toolkit 
Okay. And it's got a lot of reports around what Candice apps, what um, how the automated phones you have, who the owners are, when were the last one, what connectors they're using. Um, so that's one of the first things that I do with clients is deploy that to understand what the landscape looks like mm -hmm. just now. Um, if you're that way inclined, you can also do it using PowerShell scripts. Um, so you can write some scripts and it'll again pull out that information. Um, it's not easy to see it directly from like an admin panel. Mm -hmm. Um, you really need to write an API, connect on top of it to get it into a Power BI. But the CUE tool kit does that for you. Yeah. Is there any, um, say if you were going to be like encouraging the citizens of others to go ahead and their own flows, would you recommend applying kind of governance to uh, like limit the use of loops maybe? Is that something you'd recommend? Or? So you can't limit this, those types of steps, they are always available. Um, in terms of policies around what you can limit is you can limit connectors. Um, so using the DLP policies within the per platform, you can say that a connector is either business use, um, non-business use, or restricted. And what you can do is within that DLP, anything in business use can connect to anything else in that pot, but you can then connect a business use connector to a non-business use connector. So I worked with a client, for example, that a sales guy using Microsoft Dynamics wanted to tweet every time they won an opportunity, <laughs> not get that full right, so every time they created an opportunity, so it tweeted the information out, um, they, they caught it pretty quickly, luckily, um, but that was just a case where if you had a good DLP policy in place, you would have never been able to connect your Dynamics instance to Twitter. Um, don't get me wrong, there is some use cases, a marketing team probably does want some of that, but you would set them their own DLP policy in a different environment. Um, so yeah, so you need to be careful with, with that type of thing in terms of connectors so that you can't limit the out of the box steps. Um, so there's a set list of connectors you just can't block. Um, so mainly the Office 365 ones, so you can't limit like the Outlook connector, the SharePoint connector, the Teams connector, they are just always available. Any other questions? I'm out of time. And got to this round to 12, quick. <laughs> <laughs> no? Cool, excellent. Well, thank you very much. I say. If you do have any more questions, <laughs> <laughs>